sharing. Good. Great. And I think it's very interesting to uh, and nice to have a theory follow the experiment so people get the global picture of the whole progress. Let me unmute. Let's see. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead when you're ready. Okay, um, so thank you very much. Um, and let me um, join others in thanking David Snoke for arranging this meeting. Um, so as already trailed, I'm going to be talking about exactly the same system that um, Benjamin just talked about, um, but from a slightly different perspective. Um, but I will start with a little bit of an introduction um, in case anyone has just joined the, the meeting in between these talks, since I realize it's suddenly very early in the morning in California, um, and give just some, some structure to motivation of what it is we want to talk about. And um, what we want to discuss is using cold atoms in an optical cavity as a way to realize an associative memory. And what we really mean by that is using this kind of setup where you have atoms trapped in a hyphen S cavity and pumped from the side by this beam in red um, in such a way that it gives a, um, a Raman scheme where there is a two level system, two low lying states of the atoms. And these are coupled by absorbing a pump photon and emitting a cavity photon allowing you to control the effective pump cavity detuning. And this has been used in all kinds of, of different setups now over the, the last decade or, or so. Um, what we are particularly interested in is the multi-mode version of this, and you've, you've seen this already. Um, this has three parts. It has the energy of the photon mode, which um, depends on the detuning between the pump and the cavity. It has a coupling between the photons and the two-level systems, so these effective spins. And in this multi-mode setup, that depends on a, a mode function chi mu evaluated at the position of those spins. And then there's the energy splitting between these spins. And just to remind you continually, this is an open dissipative system. Um, and what we already know for the single mode case very well is there is this kind of transition, but when the effective coupling is weak, you have a normal state while when it becomes strong enough, you get a transition to a super radiant state where the spins are lying along plus X or along minus X. And what we really want to study is the effects of the spatial structure from a multi-mode cavity. And as Ben explained in some detail, we know how to realize tunable range interactions, sign changing interactions, and even to make them spin dependent. And all of these things have been shown with this multi-mode cavity from, from Benjamin's lab. So the, the idea, as already mentioned, is to then use this to realize something analogous to a hot field associative memory. And the hot field associative memory is this kind of recurrent neural network where there is a configuration of spins um, shown on the left here. And the state of those spins is then fed back through some connectivity matrix JIJ. And then the spin state is updated at the next time step. And the basic cartoon of the idea here is that you have memories um, which are local minima of this network, and you put in a corruptive memory and you then recover that. I should just comment that this cartoon, while very appealing, um, isn't perhaps the best thing to keep in mind, because firstly, these spins are digital, they, they are discrete states, um, so it's not a continuous landscape and continuous gradients, and it's a very high dimensional problem. And there are some differences of what you might intuitively expect in a high dimensional discrete problem versus a low dimensional continuous problem. So, so that's the motivation. And um, I want to say a bit more concrete about what is there in the standard Hopfield network to say what it is we really want to do. And, this, and to, to make the, the statements that I made on the last page more concrete, the standard Hopfield network, the thing which appears in Hopfield's paper, is a statement that you should at each time step update the state of the spins by working out the sign of the total magnetic field of AC from all of the, um, the connectivity matrix coupling to all the other spins. And then you should update the spin according to that, that state. And what you know about this is that if you reach a fixed point, if you reach some configuration where um, the energy can't be lowered any further, um, then you will have minimized this Hamiltonian or this energy functional, and you will have found a configuration S star. Now, actually, the process described above is a bit problematic. It can have limit cycles. 
So what is often typically done is an asynchronous version of this, so, um, known as zero temperature metropolis Hastings or zero temperature Glauber dynamics, where what you do is pick any of the spins which are not aligned along their magnetic field and flip them, then recalculate all the fields and then proceed again. And that's guaranteed to eventually um, stop at some point um, when all the spins are locally aligned and then you will have found the fixed point. Um, what I haven't said so far is what the JIJs should be. And actually the Hopfield network could be run with a whole variety of JIJs. But the thing which is perhaps most familiar in that context is the Hebbian learning rule, which says, if I want to store capital P patterns, I put in vectors chi um, nu from one to P. And if I run that and I um, then find a fixed point, when the density of patterns is low enough, when P is much smaller than N, then I'm guaranteed that I will find the fixed points to match those patterns. But when the number of patterns gets too big, the, these fixed points start to distort. And eventually there's then a transition to a spin glass where the behavior really starts to break down. So, so I want to say all of that to pick out of that really three key ingredients that are in that associative memory, which are the connectivity, i.e. what is the energy landscape, the dynamics, i.e. how does the spin state evolve, and the training, how do we pick the JIJs. And that's really going to um, motivate everything that I say and what follows to say, what, what is it that is possible to do with multimode cavities and what's different about them in terms of connectivity, dynamics, and training. Um, and so as, as Ben described in some detail, what we want to do is to use atoms or clumps of atoms, and I'll explain why later um, we should consider clumps, um, to use those as the spins, as the S's, to use the cavity to induce the connectivity, and to use the open quantum system dynamics to give the dynamics, and I'll defer training to what I say at the end. So the outline of what I will say in the rest of this talk is to talk first about connectivity, then about dynamics, then put those two together and talk about robustness of fixed points, and then finally talk about training, and then right at the end to discuss a bit more about the outlook in terms of um, going beyond the semi-classical description that I'll mostly be focused on. So in terms of connectivity, um, this is the general form of a multi-mode um, degenerate cavity connectivity. It's this sum over all modes of these mode functions. And if I think carefully about what the mode functions are, taking into account the GUI phase, which is really the statement that the um, propagation along the length of the cavity changes with the transverse index, then you get this kind of connectivity, which has a local part, which I'm, I'm taking as a Kronecker delta to say um, I'm thinking of clumps which are generally far apart compared to any kind of short range interaction range. And then there is this cosine part. And it's really this cosine part that we'll be interested in to ask how does that cosine connectivity um, affect what fixed points the dynamics could have, what its local minima are. And what we will do um, is put the atoms in at random positions and then find what properties the JIJ matrix has from that. So if, if a, um, the atom or clump positions are all distributed in a small um, variance distribution, so if this width of this Gaussian distribution for where the, the clumps are, if that width is much smaller than W0, um, which is the beam waste, then you get a basic ferromagnet. Now, as I've drawn here for W0 over 2, um, there's actually some probability that some of the links are negative, um, which are drawn in blue on this picture at the bottom. But still, this basically is a ferromagnet because there's very few frustrated links. Everything will just line up. As you increase W, um, there is now some frustration. There are now lots, lots of negative links. And so you might expect this would lead to an associative memory regime with lots of metastable fixed points. And then at very large W, you start to get this distribution where it's equally probable to get positive and negative links. And actually what's even more important to note is that when this distribution gets very large, then you find that the JIJ elements become basically uncorrelated. So you can calculate the correlation between JIJ and JJK 
where there's a repeated index there, the same index J appearing in two of these. And you might think that since both of these things depend on the position RJ, they would be correlated. And that is true when the distribution is narrow, but when you spread out atoms over a long distance, this correlation falls off fast enough and specifically faster than the variance of the elements in such a way that um, you can treat this as basically uncorrelated elements Jij. So with, with that basic picture, let's then explore, do we get an associative memory and do, do we get a spin glass kind of behavior at large variance? For the associative memory, what you really care is whether there are multiple metastable states. And so this picture is showing the number of metastable states as you increase this width. And you see fairly clearly there is a sharp fish transition where the number of metastable states starts to grow. This is plotted for different numbers of clumps. And um, what you can moreover show is that you can actually rescale all of this data. So if you take the difference from the critical value of W and rescale it by a power of N, you see this data all collapses. And then you can actually fit a black line through this, which is given by this formula here. And the most notable feature this suggests is that near this critical point, um, there is a um, behavior where the number of, um, well, when I say near, I mean near and just above this critical point, there is a regime where the number of metastable minima grows as an exponential of a power law of the number of clumps. It's not e to the n, but e to the n to some power. And it's worth noting that that is therefore actually distinct from a standard spin glass. So we can say that this pretty much is what we'd expect from associative memory. So for the spin glass, what we would expect is an exponential number of fixed points, not this, this exponential of a power law. Um, and showing that this is a spin glass is a challenge. But what we can be very certain of is that when our variance of the, um, of a position distribution gets very large, when W is large, then we're sure we have a spin glass because in that condition, we're sure that our matrix behaves like a random matrix. And so it's very similar to the um, prototypical spin glass model of the Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, where you just draw the JIJs from Gaussian random um, variables. And as, as you've already seen once today, um, as you increase the width, what you see is that if you look at the probability distribution of eigenvalues of a JIJ matrix, it converges on this thickness semicircle, this black line, as you increase the width. Or if you look at the probability distribution of level spacing of this um, cavity QED JIJ matrix, um, it also converges on the thickness semis um, of this probability distribution, again, shown like the black line. And you can actually go further than this. You could measure how different is the um, probability distribution from the Wigner distribution, and you see something which falls off as the width increases. But perhaps much more intriguingly, you can rescale that data and you find again a data collapse if you choose the right scaling with system size. So what this says is that there is a transition to a spin glass-like behavior when W over W naught to the four is much greater than N. And this four power makes a kind of sense because that was how the correlations between the JIJ elements fell off. So what this is saying is um, there are n or order n squared matrix elements, and you need to know how uncorrelated they are. And this determines when you get this transition to something which looks like a random matrix. I should note, it may be a spin glass before it becomes a random matrix, but what we can prove is it is a spin glass in that limit because we know it's a random matrix. So if I put everything I've said about connectivity together, you get this kind of phase diagram, which says for small widths, we definitely have a ferromagnet and that doesn't really care about the system size. And um, whereas for larger widths, we care about system size. And then there is a transition between a spin glass and associative memory, which um, is dependent on the system size from, from this result noted above. Okay, so that's ingredient one, um, the connectivity. Let me now switch to talk about dynamics. And as I've already written on more or less the first slide, this is an open quantum system. I would in principle have to solve all the dynamics of this problem, but this is a challenge because this Hilbert space is huge. And so what we want to do is to work um, under a number of uh, approximations or assumptions 
that simplify things. And those are going to be that we will work far above the superradiant transition. And the, the basic reason to focus on that is that that's where we know the eigenstates will have the S aligned along the plus or minus X direction. Um, and therefore we will have these well-defined spins. Um, what I further want to do is to say that the cavity losses and the cavity detunings are generally the largest scales in the problem. So I should adiabatically eliminate the photon modes. And then the other thing I want to do is to restrict, at least for, for, for now, for what I'm talking about in this talk, to a semi-classical limit. And the way to do that is to consider that there is some noise, which would mean superpositions of different SX states get washed out. And we can add that by hand. Um, if we want to really add it physically, that means either laser noise or some extra microwave noise source. So that can all be added if necessary. And the key point that one can then observe at that point is that if I treat this last term in the Hamiltonian as a perturbation, everything else here, and by everything I do mean everything, I mean even the noise term and even the um, dissipation term, all of that can be diagonalized by saying that basically the picture is you have eigenstates of Sx and they get dressed by a certain state of the cavity modes and that can all be fixed by a unitary transformation, a polaron transform. So after that, all I have to do is treat this omega naught term perturbatively. And when you do that, you get a kind of polaron master equation, you get a rate equation for spin flip processes, which says there are processes which will increase spin x or decrease spin x, and these will be determined by these rate functions k of delta. And I really want to say three things about these k's. The first is, they're proportional to omega naught squared. The second is their argument is the energy difference that you get when you flip one of the spins. So these delta epsilon plus or minuses are how does the total energy of the system change when I flip one of the spins from plus x to minus x. And actually this structure, this, this form comes directly from this polar one master equation um, as described on the previous slide. And then the third thing is what form does this k of delta take? And um, this is plotted by this green line on the right and ignoring a little de detail about something subtle that happens near, near zero, um, this structure has a large peak which says um, it's very favorable to flip energy which gives you the right amount of energy to balance the detuning between the pump and the resonance of the multimode cavity. And what is great is that if we choose our parameters so that that energy scale is quite big and that all the typical spin flips are somewhere in this range from naught to minus one on this scale, then we have a process where it's more likely to flip spins which release more energy. And this is quite different from zero temperature Metropolis Hastings where you only do flips which lower energy and you do them all with equal probability. It's also different from the finite temperature metropolis Hastings where everything that lowers energy is equiprobable and anything which raises energy is Boltzmann weighted. Um, and although this might look very non-thermal, we can define a kind of effective temperature because what effective temperature means at least for low energy processes is what's the relative probability of going up in energy versus going down in energy and does that match a Boltzmann distribution? And the green line shows what this is for confocal cavity dynamics. And you can fit this at, at low energies. Well, really, you can fit it to a straight line. And from that, you can extract an effective temperature. And then you hit a slight bug. And that slight bug is that this effective temperature turns out to be typically larger than the JIJs, which would seem a showstopper, except that's not the energy scale we care about. If we have clumps of atoms um, with many atoms per clump, then the energy scale we care about is actually multiplied by the size of that clump. And so that then fixes all of this. We can easily get into a regime um, with thousands of atoms per clump where we're effectively looking at low temperature dynamics. And actually that fix also brings with it a great benefit, which is that if you have many atoms per clump, these spin flip dynamics become super radiant. Once one atom in a clump has flipped, um, actually we don't know which atom it is, it, it, there's constructive interference of all the atoms in the clump trying to flip, 
and that leads to a super radiant enhancement of how fast the clumps fit. So if I try and look at what that really means, if you actually do direct simulation of what's the rate of every possible atom flipping and then update the state after that, that's what's shown by these solid lines. This is taking something which is almost the right state, but with three clumps the wrong way around. And what you see is these three clumps in turn then, then flip back to what they should be. Um, what you find because of that, that idea of using large clumps is actually you don't have to do anything stochastic at all. The individual atomic dynamics may look stochastic, but when you look on the large scale of a clump, because there are thousands of atoms per clump, the dynamics becomes effectively deterministic, saying that there is a fast process where there's a super radiant enhancement and one clump completely flips. Note this is a log scale in time. Um, and then there is a long wait before the next clump flip, flips. And actually you can do even more than that. You can solve those deterministic equations. They're really just the super radiant um, dynamics of a, of a single clump extended to many clumps. And you can then say, which is the clump that's going to flip next? It is the clump which has the smallest value of this T0. And that directly translates to the clump which has the largest energy flip, energy change, when I flip that, that clump. And so that is what directly gives you this kind of super radiant steepest descent dynamics. Um, you find whichever clump will lower the energy most, flip that one first, and then flip the others. Um, I should point out, after each clump has flipped, of course, all the energy costs will need to be recalculated, but it's still a basic super radiant descent dynamics. So let me then um, recap what Benjamin already said of what happens when you put together connectivity and this dynamics. Um, by taking a fixed point of the, the connectivity, distorting it a bit, and then asking what fixed point do you get to when this thing relaxes. And I'm going to illustrate this first for the Hebbian connectivity, for the kind of textbook Hopfield network. And this picture here is one you've already seen um, that says, for the zero temperature metropolis Hastings problem, as a function of the input error, you see the probability of recalling the, the state you, you started in. And after some error, it starts to go down. Whereas for either the cavity dynamics or the steepest descent dynamics, you can tolerate much larger errors. And where this is coming from is that with the steepest descent dynamics, um, you will only get to the wrong state if you have gone far enough away that the steepest path downhill takes you somewhere else. Um, so in this, this cartoon that I warned is a bad idea to really think about too deeply, um, then actually you would say that everywhere in this basin of attraction, it, the only downhill direction will take you back to this fixed point. But really it's a multidimensional landscape and it's got discrete fin, spin flips. And what you find is that with a kind of stochastic process where you can follow any path as long as it's downhill, you don't care how steep it is, you find that that zero temperature metropolis Hastings can take you to other fixed points earlier than the deterministic dynamics. Um, what that therefore means is if you ask what's the average size of a basin of attraction as say a function of a pattern loading for the, the Hebbian connectivity, it remains finite out to very large pattern loadings. And this is perhaps at first surprising because what this is actually saying is that even in a spin glass, and actually we can show this, even in a true spin glass, the mean basin size is extensive in the number of clumps. Um, and not only is it extensive, if you look at this graph here of a probability of the basin being of a certain size versus its size, you find that where is for zero temperature metropolis Hastings almost all basins are small. Um, for the steepest descent dynamics, most basins are extensive and many basins are quite big. So that's for heavy in learning. If I then put this together with the actual connectivity of the confocal cavity, then what you get is a picture which says um, there's a ferromagnet which is quite boring to begin with and there everything um, is either attracted to um, all spin up or all spin down, so every basin is size half. Then you go into the associated memory regime 
and we find that the steepest descent dynamics is um, gives you much bigger basins and much more robustness than the um, than the zero temperature metropolis Hastings did. And as you go to very large whips, we get an asymptote to this green line, which is the result through a, um, through a spin glass showing in Kirkpatrick model, i.e. this basin size remains finite even in this very large width limit. So I've told you about connectivity and dynamics and then robustness of memories. And the last thing I, was, I wanted to talk about was training. And this is where there is a, a perhaps a problem, but it's a solvable problem. And the problem is that we have this kind of recipe that says we put in atom or clump positions and we get from that a JIJ matrix and we get from that the fixed points of this dynamics. And this is very hard to invert. Now, I can go from memories to JIJs by heavy and learning or from or methods like pseudo inverse, but trying to invert my JIJ, which is a cosine of, a, of the positions, is a very hard task. And at some level, it's not a really well-defined task. There are n squared elements of the JIJ matrix. There are two n coordinates of the positions. So I seem to have too few variables to satisfy this. Because the cosine is periodic and therefore highly oscillatory, I can though get as close as I would like to any JIJ matrix if I'm allowed to put my atoms anywhere in space. But solving that problem is, is hard and it um, is not a problem that we really want to have to solve. And so what we want to do instead is to talk about encoding, which means take an approach where you know the fixed points of your dynamics, you know the S stars, and you have a set of patterns you want to store. And what you can do is find linear maps, M and M inverse, that map you from a pattern to a fixed point or from a fixed point to a pattern. And these maps can be found by this kind of simple um, optimization of a um, um, continuous um, matrix problem. And once you've done that, there is a straightforward recipe. You choose your corrupt pattern, you encode it to an initial spin state um, by this, this route where you map by the matrix M and then take the threshold of these. And then you evolve the dynamics, find the final state, and then you map it by the inverse map and you get the recalled probability, a uh, recalled um, pattern. And we can then actually simulate all of the steps of that and compare this to a standard Hebbian learning process. And when you put all of the steps together, so the, the encoding, the time evolution with the cavity dynamics, plus the cavity connectivity, plus the decoding, and then say, how well do you recover the, the memory? you find that there is indeed a finite basin of attraction for this full dynamics right up until you try to put in as many patterns as there are clumps. And actually the only reason that this goes to zero out here is this encoding step. It's, it's a limitation of linear encodings, but you can't encode more than the dimensionality of your, your problem. Um, so in principle, if we replace this by a nonlinear encoding, there might even be a possibility of having finite basin sizes out to a pattern loading much higher than n because we know what our associated memory has um, exponentially many in, the, in a power of system size and we know that these all have finite basins of attraction in the large w limit so there is a possibility there to go well beyond what you could expect with a standard Hopfield network. So in the last five minutes, let me just mention um, the outlook to go beyond this semi-classical regime. And um, this has many challenges. And I will talk about the experimental challenge of, of doing that and then about the, the challenges this poses for theory. Um, experimentally, it would mean you should get rid of any noise that might cause dephasing. And actually, that might not even be something you have to do. We, we actually added a, a noise source so that we could force ourselves into something we believe is classical, um, you would want to operate near threshold because you would not like to be in a state where the spins are really well-defined, distinct macroscopic objects. But also at the same time, you would like to reduce the sizes of your collective spins for each cluster so that there is more of a possibility for, for quantum effects to, to do something. And that's really the step which is perhaps the greatest challenge because um, that, that was forced on us by this balance of 
temperature versus JIJs, but we know where that comes from. We know what is the, the set of parameters that caused that. It's the ratio of the effect of G versus kappa. And therefore, what we really need to do to get deeper into that quantum regime is either smaller kappa, which actually also at the same time means make the cavities more, con more perfectly confocal so that you don't, um, so that the um, aberrations of the cavity are also not a limiting factor or equivalently increase the coupling um, of the, the clumps of atoms to the cavity light. And if you can do that, then you're well on the way to, to realizing a kind of um, um, quantum regime of this problem. Theoretically, actually, I think there's more of a challenge of how you really model this. Um, because if I can't do my approximations to get a nice effective atom only equation, then I either have to do all the atoms in which case I'm really um, stuck by how big the Hilbert space is for this problem with many cavity modes, many atoms, and therefore maybe we're stuck to do things with small ends, or I need to do some higher order um, expansion um, to go beyond this kind of time local effective Redfield um, theory or effective master equation that we have, um, which could mean going to higher orders in G or higher orders in omega naught, or I have to find some completely new algorithm that really focuses in on what is the part of the Hilbert space that has the interesting correlations. And if we can do all of that, then the, the goal is, does this, does the, do these quantum effects have any effect on memory capacity? And much more important, um, do they have any effect on the time scales for the dynamics to run? and to recover the fixed points. So let me acknowledge exactly the same set of people Benjamin acknowledged. Um, this, this work has really been pushed forward by a graduate student, Brendan Marsh, along with collaboration from Brendan's other graduate students, um, Yudan Gru and Ronan Kruse. Um, and um, this is work done in collaboration with Sarango Palakrishnan from CUNY and Surya Ganguly, who's an um, expert in neuroscience and machine learning from Stanford. And I'll put up here a reminder of all the pictures that I showed you, and thank you for your attention. Great. Jonathan, thanks so much. Let's give uh, you a big applause. Um, questions from the audience? Again, you can raise your hand on the Zoom or just send a uh, message to me. I'll try to do that. Oh, Natalia, you're always the quick one. So let me unmute you. Can you yes, go ahead? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Great, great talk. Very, very fascinating. Um, uh, I have a question about the training part, about the slide on training. So you're saying that ideally you would like to be able to controllably uh, change JIJs by uh, changing the positions of the atoms. Right? And, then, and, and this is, of course, a very difficult problem to solve because your connections are non-local. But yeah. I can see how the alternative approach, this encoding, um, is an easy problem to do because you still have the quadratic uh, kind of minimization problem. But it's a, con a quadratic continuous minimization problem you solve once. Um, so, so the idea is you run your network, you find its natural memories, mm -hmm. um, and then once you've done that, you um, have this optimization problems to solve once to find the ends. And then after that, um, whenever you put in a corrupted memory, um, you've got your M's. So there's, no, there's no repetition of that step. You don't do it on every step, right? So yeah. Uh, can you please also um, comment? Oh, OK, so sorry. I, I don't want to occupy the entire. I think it's fine. We can have a two minutes. We're 80 minutes later, not, but not due to uh, Jonathan, but due to we start a little late, uh, like two minutes, and then we had a lot of excitement discussion with Ben. So we still have two minutes. Go okay, ahead. Are there any other questions? No. Uh, uh, you, okay, go ahead. There, there's no question yet. Yeah. Uh, can you just comment uh, on these two um, approaches, let's say, if you're trying to do uh, this, this kind of approach, but using two different types of networks. On one hand, you have the here enticing machine kind of thing. And, uh, and then you have this kind of uh, BEC with the dissipation, right? These are two different uh, ways to, to actually um, operate. So which has 
the advantage in your in your opinion which would be um, which um so, so um i mean i think actually there's probably three things in this category um because there's coherentizing machines where it's a uh, light mode that is your degree of freedom um there is, there is the kind of thing which comes out of a kind of traditional picture of quantum simulation where your degree of freedom is where the atom is. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this where the degree of freedom that's storing the information is about this kind of spin state, so internal state of the atom. Um, um, the, the problem with the coherentizing machine or the Plaraton version where it's the light degree of freedom is that it's very difficult to get away from a regime where you want to think of things purely semi-classically. Because if you just attenuate the amplitudes, um, it's not obvious you still have this interesting dynamics. Whereas here, what we can in principle imagine doing is push up this ratio G over kappa, and then uh, at least in principle, we get into a regime where the dynamics definitely is quantum. Um, and um, we're still operating on the same kind of principle where there might be some gain-based amplification. Um, and I, so I don't know that I can say that is promising. What I can say is that's, to me, an unknown question because actually it's very hard to model theoretically. And um, I think the danger is that what we will end up with is theory modeling that tells us about small n and says, look, it's great, it works really well. Um, and of course, um, I, I'll say the thing which um, I think Benjamin should really like, which is at that point, what you have to do is the experiment. There, there's no way out. If, if you really have an algorithm which makes intrinsic use of the system and its quantum dynamics, um, the, the, the ultimate goal in a theorist, for a theorist in this kind of field should be to make themselves redundant by getting to a point where you're solving problems you can't solve. So it's really the quantum, quantumness of this. I, I think there is a potential to get to quantumness with this, which I find much harder to see how you get to that with other systems where it's really light-based degrees of freedom. I mean, I, I think the answer we, we sort of know with the Plaraton, you would have to get to a regime where you had single significant photon. single photon nonlinearities. And All right, yeah. That, yeah, that's achievable. Um, there, there are hints towards that in, in what Pavlos talked about with single photon classical switching and in the experiments with um, various kinds of Rydberg polaritons. But, but when I say achievable, what that means is people saw G2s of 0 0.95 um, and, and that, that state of the art. And it's quite a challenge. How do you really go beyond that? Oh, yes. All right. So um, we are about 10 minutes late, but very exciting. So Natanya, sorry to cut off you. Uh, we do have a last question, <laughs> actually two other questions, but then let me choose one from the uh, organizer, Dave Snoke. He uh, has a question for Jonathan. So he will be the last question before we move on to the next speaker. But in the same time, I would do, so Jonathan, uh, so Dave, can you go ahead? You can unmute yourself, right? Yeah, actually, I just was um, <clears throat> interested if Jonathan could talk a little bit about, I mean, these are both sort of neural network type things. And we had on Monday a talk from Timothy Liu's group about um, they're using polaritons to solve neural networks. So could you sort of compare and contrast to the, the two different approaches? Right. So, so the field of neural networks is huge. And there are some broad um, categories of things you can divide up. Um, the, the thing which is sort of um, world famous now, the, the, the thing which tells you which YouTube video to watch next, etc., is about a um, deep neural network and what you are doing is training the weights in that network according to some set of training data. Um, what we're talking about is a kind of different thing, which is about associative memory and, and recovery of, of memories. Um, and um, and certainly in the thing that, that I just talked about, we, we didn't really do anything about training the weights in the network. We did training by encoding. Um, and that's because of the difficulty of um, how do we tune the JIJs physically in this setup. There is a whole extra field, which is what um, um, we heard about on Monday, 
of how do you get something out of a network where you can't do the training you would like. And the basic idea there, um, let me just summarize it for anyone who didn't hear that talk. It, it's um, known by various terms like reservoir computing. And the idea is that um, one thing you would often like to do is to take um, not just your data and linearly do some kind of linear fit or linear extrapolation on it, but you'd like to do a kind of non-linear fit where I include higher powers, so maybe second and third and fourth powers. And the thing that reservoir computing does is uses some physical device to take your data, which maybe has n elements, and then give you many more than n elements, which are all kinds of nonlinear transforms of your data, which are more or less random, that you don't really care what they are. All you care is that you've got lots of nonlinear transforms of your data, and then you do a linear fit parameter. So, so a linear fitting, which says, um, I take all of those nonlinear stuff and I try to use that to predict the one thing I would like to know. And it turns out that works very well. Um, you, you can do linear fitting on a non-linearized version of your data. But these are all, these are really three different things which are going on within neural networks. They're, they're not the same kind of operation. Great. So um, let's move on. Uh, let's thanks uh, to the great talk by Jonathan.